Okay, so stage one of, adoles of adolescent use. And again, this is, as I mentioned in a previous segment here, um, experimentation frequently starts seventh grade. So this stage really could be seventh grade and on up. Okay, it's, um, it's commonly uh, middle school uh, through high school, through junior high. Um, the way the charts are set up is the left-hand column are the drug use patterns that we look for in this stage. And the right column is the external behaviors that we look for. Okay, so we can start to identify uh, the differences. Okay, so drug use patterns. This is stage one called experimental use. Um, occasional use of tobacco, beer, wine, pot, and use of inhalants. It's usually done on weekends or during vacation time. It's almost always done with friends. It's rarely done in isolation. It's a social activity. Uh, there's a low tolerance. That means it's easy to get high on a small amount of the drug. And the thrill of acting grown up or defying parents and authorities is part of the high. So that's part of the experience of the drug use. The behaviors that we look for is that it's most often unplanned. The beer, wine, and pot and inhalants are usually sneaked from home or friends' homes. There's little use of harder drugs at this stage. And drug, abuse, drug use is equated with good feelings. Few or no negative side effects. There's euphoria that's associated with self-medication of pain. Okay? So in this stage, for the person that's eventually going to become a co-occurring or duly diagnosed patient, this is where they start experiencing that the medication, self-medication with illicit use is actually going to start treating the mental health diagnosis. So that's stage one. Stage two is called social use or regular use. Now with drug use, we don't like to think of regular use as a good um, concept. But the reality is regular use is something that happens with most kids. Um, it's important to remember that experimental use and regular use are normally not addiction. Okay? This is normal adolescent behavior. This is normal adolescent drug use. I would really try to avoid making a formal diagnosis of dependency or addiction at this stage because if we diagnose too early, it may be a misdiagnosis, which then follows somebody for the rest of their life, and that's not necessarily a good thing. Okay, so this is, uh, and the kind of people that can do counseling with kids at the first and second stage are anyone who's got experience in working with adolescents. Okay, you don't have to be a substance abuse professional to deal with the first two stages. So these patterns begin junior high through early senior high. Um, the drug use pattern goes like this. Tolerance increases with increased use. More activities start to involve kegs, cases, pot, pills, and hash, and tobacco as an ongoing thing. We accept the idea that everybody's doing it, and I want to be part of the group. This is the beginning of the peer pressure thing. Many people think that the reason kids start drug use is for peer pressure. No, the initial use in that first stage is experimentation. Once they've experimented, the reason, one of the reasons they continue is because of peer pressure, because they want to be part of a group. A disdain for local pot. 
years ago, I was uh, contracted with Sea Caucus School District to s help set up the early um, SAC program for them. And uh, so I started doing a little research before I got there. And since uh, for a, quite a while I taught at the State Police Academy, I taught the narcotics, advanced narcotics course, so I knew a lot of cops. So I went to the cops that I knew there and I said, tell me about what's going on with the high school kids and middle school kids with uh, drug use in town. And they told me, oh, it's interesting because we supply the pot. I said, what do you mean you supply the pot? They said, well, look down the road. And, you know, Sea Caucus is kind of a self-enclosed little community. What's it surrounded by? The Meadowlands. Swamp. He said, people outside Sea Caucus don't realize this, but the kids in Sea Caucus all know. Marijuana grows wild in the Meadowlands, in the swamps. And the kids know from a very early age, once they get near middle school, they know what part of the swamp to go to to harvest their own marijuana. Parents don't know this, but the kids know it. So kids will grow up initially not bothering buying pot, not bothering going out of their way to risk getting caught buying pot. They know after school they can go down to the water's edge and pick their own. And the cops are telling me this, and I'm saying, well, can't you do anything? He says, well, every once in a while, we try to burn the crop down. The problem is everybody smells the marijuana burning. So that became counterproductive. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was going into the school to help set up the training and that sort of thing, apparently none of the teachers knew about this either. So I started talking about that. But here's one of the things I learned from Sea Caucus. In the experimental stage and in the regular use stage, they just went down the street into the swamps to harvest their own grass. At the end of the second stage of regular use, the local pot was no longer adequate. Their sophisticated use of grass was now, I'm no longer going to be satisfied with sea caucus green when I can get, grab the ferry, go to the other side of the river and get Acapulco gold. So that the stage of use was based on the quality of the drug. Okay? So we, we, we see that with a lot of different kinds of things. Um, but it was, uh, I just found it was interesting that you had a whole community where kids grew up knowing where to start using pot. And the answer was down the street. And the cops all knew about it, but when they tried to correct the problem, people complained that there was too much pot smell. So they stopped burning it down, which meant that it kept growing. Okay. Um, I also have another friend, my spiritual director, who was one of the monks up at um, St. Paul's Abbey in Newton, and uh, they used to have a summer camp. And uh, he was in charge of the camp. And one year at the end of the season, he found that one of the cabins of kids had pot. So he did the real Catholic thing, and he kind of took the pot and had a meeting at the edge of the lake, and he did his yelling and screaming thing, and. Now, th this was before he himself got into recovery. <laughs> but he did his yelling and screaming thing, and he took the pot in his hand, and he threw it into the lake to make a scene about this was just bad. You're not supposed to do it. The following spring, he had marijuana growing up all along the edge, <laughs> edge of the lake. <laughs> so marijuana is a relatively easy thing to grow. It, can go, it's, it really grows wild. It is a weed, literally, um, but it can be harvested. But the stuff that grows wild is very low percentage THC. Okay. 
what we have now in, in that low percentage THC when it grows wild, you're talking two to five percent quality. What you can now get in processed marijuana, you can get, now get 90 to 99 percent THC. So in the 60s when I was growing up in that time, good pot was like 11 percent. People who are parents my age and a little younger, that's what they remembered as smoking pot when they were young. It's hard to find marijuana these days that low in percentage. Now the lowest you're going to buy on the street is probably 60 percent THC level. So the percentage is really high. I try to tell parents when they say, oh, I did this when I was a kid and all that. I say, well, it's like the difference between drinking near beer and straight scotch. It's both alcohol, but they're very different. Okay. And just as a um, aside, this goes into some pharmacology, you know about non-alcoholic beer and you know about CBD oil. Non-alcoholic beer has how much alcohol in it? Non-alcohol. No. Non-alcoholic beer is able to have anything less than 2% alcohol. Heineken's has a Heineken Zero, 2% alcohol. I've had some alcoholics relapse on zero Heineken's. And they're the type of alcoholic that a little bit of alcohol sends them over the edge. But they thought they were being safe by drinking non-alcoholic beer. Now, non-alcoholic beer has its own potential problems with head games. But pharmacologically, non-alcoholic beer has alcohol in it. CBD oil, no THC, right? No. CBD oil can have as much as 10% THC and still advertise as no THC. So if someone is using high levels of CBD oil, either topically or orally, and they go to take a, a pre-employment test, and if they're still testing for THC, it can show up positive. I've had a number of physician clients who were, they finished medical school, they're going into residency, their first year of residency, pre-employment test, and these great students coming up positive for THC. When we do the full evaluation and uh, figure out that it really was CBD oil, we tell them, well, the THC is from the CBD, but there's no THC in CBD. Yes, there is. Because the way they can advertise it, if it's less than 10%, they can say it's free of THC. So that's one of the things that people need to know. Okay. Now, a lot of places, um, including Catholic charities, um, we no longer do pre-employment testing with, for THC. This is one of the reasons. Um, it's, a, it's legal for all practical purposes. Um, and even when people think they're not using it, they're sometimes using it. Uh, another case where interpreting um, drug results you need to be aware of, and this is why medical review officers, uh, Dr. R is one, um, he's the only one that, that's allowed to interpret drug testing. Okay, uh, You have to be a, a legitimate medical review officer. Um, we had a couple cases uh, with our doctors over the years, people who were doing really well in recovery. And um, everything, the recovery plan was in good place. They had a lot of good recovery time, doing good stuff, family stuff going well, job stuff going well all of a sudden shows up positive for alcohol. 
because we have to check it out thoroughly. What do you think is on sugar-free, what is in sugar-free ice cream? Sugar, alcohol. What? See, you got to read the stuff on the back of the package. There's a thing called sugar alcohol, which makes up for the lack of sweetener put into it. And now, I have since been identified as diabetic, type 2, so I can't do this anymore. But I used to be really thrilled that Hagen Doss made a single serving cup of ice cream. Now, when you read it carefully, it says, this is three servings. <laughs> but I never bothered reading that stuff. So every night, and this was frequently while I was at the Straight and Arrow, um, that would be my Johnny Carson snack. Okay, So I eventually got told, you're stupid. You should read stuff. Um, so that was my sugar problem. But a lot of people think, dietary ice cream is going to help with the diet but not understand that it could show up in a positive urine test for alcohol. Okay. The other thing that we did, and if you remember uh, when Reagan's war on drug drugs began, uh, one of the things he announced that he was going to start urine testing his entire upper level, level staff. Um, within a week, the Admiral of the Navy came up with a positive urine test for opiates. Well, after the big PR thing that Reagan had and his wife had would just say no and all that, um, he was kind of stuck. So they were doing the investigation. And one of the things that they found was that the Admiral of the Navy, who came up positive for opiates, this was like panic time for the administration. His routine was, when he came into the office every day, one of his lower level sailors, who was his equivalent to a secretary, typist, um, he would make sure that on his desk was his coffee and his bagel. With cream cheese. And the bagel was a poppy seed bagel. And when they started doing the urine testing, he shows up positive for opiates because he ate a poppy seed bagel. The poppy seed bagel does give enough. So we had a client who uh, lived relatively near our offices, and he comes up positive for opiate. And he was like doing everything right for his treatment plan. He was really actively involved in doctors and AA and all that sort of thing. Um, his practice was booming. Family life was really good. And um, his family life was so good, uh, when he first got into recovery, they had one kid. Then once he got into some decent recovery, he got, they got pregnant again, and this time she had triplets. So rather quickly, they went from one to four. I consider that stressful. Okay, So um, part of what he would always do, he made sure that on Sundays he would never work. Sunday was the day that he would take all four kids, put them in this crazy stroller contraption and take them out so that his wife had a morning where she didn't have to do anything. And she would go down. They lived in a town that had a little village and they had a bakery. And he would walk down with the kids to the bakery. He would buy muffins. They would then walk back to the house. And by that time, mom is getting up and dad would make some eggs and all that sort of thing, and they would have fresh muffins. Well, he started showing up positive for opiates. So we're doing the questioning that you have to do as an MRO, and 
um, eventually figure out, okay, the only thing that could be a problem here is the muffins because he did mention that they were poppy seed and how he and the wife both liked the poppy seed uh, muffins. So Dr. Canavan says, um, okay, next Sunday, buy two extra muffins, and after you're done with your family thing at home on Sunday, come over to my house, bring the two extra muffins, and my wife and I are going to have muffins with you. And then what he did is he then had the muffins, and every hour on the hour, he tested himself with our urine screen test. That same that following day, I was going to be going down to Southern Ocean Hospital to see clients. And after I was done with the clients, I went in the cafeteria and I bought a poppy seed bagel and ate it and then tested myself every hour on the hour. Both of us, after about three to four hours, we were showing positive for opiates because the poppy seed bagels and muffins were had enough in it from the poppy seed to show up positive as opiates. So that's a real thing. So if you get somebody who shows up positive for opiates, do not automatically refer them back to probation for a violation of a screen because that's why an MRO has to determine uh, whether it's legitimate positive or not because that positive can mess up somebody's life tremendously, okay? So that, that's why urine testing should never be the end all and be all for determining if somebody's doing well in recovery. It's one piece of the picture, okay? And the alcohol thing and the um, opiate thing are two things that need to be checked out very, very carefully, okay? So anyway, that's, uh, that's part of it with the local pot and all that. Um, preferring brand beers are now more accept, preferred brand beers are now more acceptable. Um, I tell people w with schools, junior highs, go to the local place, usually in the woods, where kids hang out. And depending on the bottles that are left there, you can tell what stage the drinkers are in. If they're drinking, and the, now with all the local brands, we can't do this anymore. But in those days, I would say, if they're drinking Pabst or Redding beer, they're in early stage because they'll drink any kind of beer. <laughs> when you start finding Heineken's and these more sophisticated drugs, then you know they've gone from stage one to stage two because people who are in stage two will not smoke the cheap stuff. They will not drink the cheap stuff. They want to show sophistication, okay? And that's part of stage two. Again, this is not addiction. This is regular use. Uh, more wine and liquor, but beer is still gonna be more popular. There's a willingness to suffer hangovers. This is the thing I try to convince parents of. When this kid who doesn't know what he's doing or she's doing gets drunk and they get up in the morning and they have a headache, they think they have a headache. They think they have an upset stomach. They have not learned that when I drink like this, my body reacts like that. You have to, this has to be a learning experience. Hey kid, this is called a hangover. <laughs> so. This junior high kid may have to be taught what a hangover is. However, in this stage, they know when I drink like this, I'm gonna feel like that, but I'm willing to drink like this anyway. There's a willingness to suffer the hangover. The euphoria is worth the bad feeling later on. Weeknight use might begin Solitary use may begin. Blackouts may begin. Now, we used to think that blackouts were a sign of uh, advanced alcoholism. No more. 
we now understand that blackouts begin very small and they develop over time. So once somebody starts having blackouts, over time, if they're prone to blackouts, not everybody is, but if they're prone to blackouts, they will start very short in duration and over time get longer and longer and more intense. Okay? So very early stage blackouts, I can't find my glasses. Don't know where I put them. Same thing with car keys. Thanks, same things with going out to a club and not being able to find your car because you forgot where you parked it. Minor blackouts. As time goes on, the time frame for the blackout gets longer and they become more frequent. My first client with a blackout. I was starting at Straight and Narrow, this was before I was ordained, and in the detox, they were trying to train me on how to do counseling. So we were using the medical model of training at that time, so initially, I would sit in on Dr. Canavan's interview with the patient. And I would watch how he did it, the questions he asked, and all that. Then after I did that a couple times, he would sit in on me doing it, and then eventually, and he would take part in that discussion, and then eventually I would do the entire thing and he would keep his mouth shut, and then at the end he would tell me if I needed to do something differently. So that was the way we learned, I learned how to do intakes. Eventually, they let me talk to a patient alone in a room. So this was like a big thing. So I get in the room alone and you'll be able to figure out the year for this. The first patient that I interviewed in detox was an Eastern Airline pilot. Anybody remember Eastern Airline? Okay. Eastern became Continental. Okay. Um, so a pilot. Oh, so what motivated you to come into treatment? Well, I had a blackout and it really scared me. I said, tell me about the blackout. Well, I really don't remember much, which is what happens in a blackout, you don't remember. He said, um, I was landing in Newark and as the wheels screeched as it touched down, that you know that screeching noise, that's what snapped him out of his blackout. And he realized that he didn't know what airport he was in. He didn't remember what airport he had taken off from. He later found out he had come in from San Francisco nonstop to Newark. The whole flight was uneventful. Nobody knew he was intoxicated because he was functioning normally, but he had no recall of the whole trip. And he said he snapped out of the blackout when it touched down in Newark and he realized he didn't know where he was or where he had come from. And in those days, if you were a pilot and you were alcoholic, you would never be a pilot again. So he secretly took some vacation time and got himself checked in to go for detox. The following week, I was supposed to get on an Eastern flight to Florida. And I was like, do I really want to go to Florida that bad? <laughs> you know, but this was my first example of how a black, I mean, a lot of people think a blackout is passing out. That's not the case at all. When you're in a blackout, you function perfectly normally, except you have no recall of the events. So you function well, but it's like temporary amnesia. For him, it was a couple hours worth. But he functioned well. There were no problems with takeoff, no problems with landing, no problems in the air. Everybody was satisfied, nobody thought he was drunk, all that sort of thing. 
but he had no recall of anything. After I started working with doctors, I got my second good example for blackouts. Had a doc who was a surgeon. Um, he needed to be in recovery. He eventually got into recovery and died sober. But he was in his hospital, and it's a North Jersey hospital, and I will not mention the name of it. He was um, in the parking lot of the hospital. He was in the car. The door was open. His butt was still on the seat. One foot was in the car. The other was on the pavement of the parking lot when he snapped out of his blackout. He didn't know whether he was going into the hospital or coming out of the hospital. Now, once you start having blackouts, you start remembering how to cover for them. Okay. So he had had a couple instances, so he took care of himself by saying to himself, OK, I'll go into the hospital to the doctor's entrance. And if the receptionist there says, good morning, doc, that means I haven't been here yet. And if the receptionist says, hi, doc, did you forget something? That means I've been here. So he walks in and she says, oh, did you forget something? And he goes, yeah, I got to go up to the OR and get it. He goes up to check the schedule. And he had just finished three hours of surgery. Everything went well. Nobody noticed intoxication or anything like that, but he was in a blackout. So again, when you're in a blackout, you function normally, but you just have no recollection of it. Okay? He was a well-known surgeon in the area. Okay? So he was able to do everything because he knew how to do it, but he had no recall of it. So when blackouts begin, they're not that extreme. It's little things. So blackouts can begin even before the addiction starts. Okay. Um, Risk-taking use begins. A lot of this for middle school kids is going to depend on the family system. What is risk-taking? First of all, drinking and driving, that's risk-taking. But a lot of people in this stage are pre-licensed. So for a lot of kids in this stage, risk-taking use can be coming home with alcohol on the breath and having mom or dad smell the alcohol. That can be risk-taking. Okay. With some people, drinking during school, smoking during school, things that are going to raise red flags for people, this can be risk-taking. But in this stage, risk-taking use begins even though the addiction hasn't started yet. Okay, so that's part of regular use. Preoccupation begins. The next high is planned and anticipated. The source of supply is a matter of worry. This is the stage where you don't need to drink every day. You don't need to smoke every day or whatever. But just in case you want it, I need to know it's there. So there's a preoccupation beginning. Not for everyday use, but what we call this usually is a stash. You start hiding some of the booze, you start hiding some of the pot. Uh, not that you're going to need it every day, but just in case. I know where it is. Um, another thing that happens in this stage we're walking down the street, walking towards each other. I say to you, want to go get high? You say, no, um, I don't have anything. Do you? And I say, no. So we say, ah, it's too bad. So we each go our own way. And then I go back home, but I got my stash. So I can then get high. I wasn't going to share it with you. But just in case I wanted it, it's there. So that stash becomes a symptom of the stage. Um, Start to use it to make it through the day or through social situations. When they start using to be part of social activities, when they only use when there's a party to go to or something like that, something like that symptomatic thing I was talking about this morning, that, that's, that can be this stage. It's not addiction, but it can show how the progression is starting. 
um, experience, experimentation, or use with harder drugs or illegal drugs may begin at this stage. Usually prior to this stage, it's not going to be a lot of illegal stuff. It's going to be mostly socially acceptable stuff. The external behavior, more money starts to be involved in the lifestyle, and it's because the alcohol, pot, etc., is now purchased and shared with friends. In stage one, they just get it from home, or their friends bring it from their home, but they're not going out to solicit the drug. In this stage, they're starting to go out and solicit. Parents or schools start to become aware of the use. And I'm careful when I do this with teachers because I emphasize this is about students, not teachers. <laughs> with students, grounding for keeping late hours, unexcused absences, detentions, negative acting out, suspensions. These are all behaviors that are associated with drug use during this stage. This is regular use. Now what happens with this, since it's maybe a first time or a rare experience, the school or the family treats it not as a drug problem, but as an absentee problem or a late problem or not doing the homework properly. Unwittingly, they're buying into the denial syndrome. But it's because it's such early stage that it doesn't look like full-blown addiction. So the good news is they're not stigmatizing. The bad news is they probably should be looking a little closer. Okay, But this is what's happening at this stage. And again, this is not addiction. This is just regular use. Drug-using friends are often not introduced to parents. There's a lying to parents about the extent of use the use of money for drugs, where they're going or staying. Cutting school increases, school activities dropped, especially sports, clubs, um, and any, in some positive peer groups. Now, this is an area where we do see in adolescence some difference between male and female. During this stage, as drug use starts to get heavier, males tend to be sloppier. Girls tend to be more together. Okay, uh, I've been asked a lot of times why I think this happens. I think it's because there's such a, such a stigma to women who are drug users or alcoholics that there's a subconscious thing. I want to make sure I don't look like one. So girls will make sure that they look better, they're acting better, and that sort of, kind of the Betty Ford type syndrome, where they're looking good, so nobody knows. Um, boys tend to get more disheveled, not showering as much, looking like a mess. But that's what you expect from 15-year-old boys. But girls tend to overcompensate sometimes. Um, also with sports and clubs, we used to think that dropping out of sports was a real thing, but we now know that there are certain drugs which lend themselves to um, uh, being better in sports. You know, uh, cocaine can help people in early stages do better in athletics. Now, we haven't heard this in quite in, in a couple of years, but before COVID, try to think back, the number of college basketball players that died of a heart attack on the court it was cocaine-related in almost every instant because the cocaine was affecting the heart and when put to high activity, created a heart attack. So that was an example where drug taking was not something that you noticed because they dropped out of sports, but it was part of. Okay. Long distance running also has a thing about opiates and painkillers. Because long distance running 
when the body starts getting in pain, an opiate can slow down the pain. Okay. Who do you think were the first long distance runners, walkers, whatever, to use opiates? Alexander the Great's army. The way Alexander kept them marching for such long distance was by feeding them opium. Okay. And their feet were bloody from the march. They were sometimes with shoes, sometimes without, but they were able to keep marching because they didn't feel the pain. And Alexander didn't know about that until he got to Afghanistan, where the locals taught him what poppy seeds can do. And that's how we learned our beginnings about opiate addiction. Okay. So non-drug-using friends are frequently dropped during this stage. There's a concentration on fooling others when high, and weekend-long parties may begin. Concentration on fooling others when high. Um, every once in a while, you find a strange cable station. I found one a couple of weeks ago. The title of the show was DWI. <laughs> and what they did, it was one of these reality shows. Uh, they were doing around Nevada and Texas mostly, in Arizona. And they would follow the cops as they stopped DWI cases. And they would videotape the arrests. Well, have you ever seen somebody pulled over for a DWI? Next time you see one, pull over and stop and watch. Okay, here's part of the test. Part of the test is walk the straight line. So heel to toe. Well, most of us can walk a straight line heel to toe even if we have a couple drinks in us. Do not think that the cop is watching your feet. The cop is not watching your feet. The cop is watching your hands. Because as we learn how to be drunk, we also learn how to compensate. And when we're told to walk the straight line, if we're a little bit drunk, we may be able to do it, but we're doing it like this. If we're totally sober, once you're 75, you can't do this, so you have to trust me. <laughs> If you're totally sober, you can do it with your hands at your side. But put a couple drinks, and we start to do the hands. The other test is arms apart like this, fingers pointed, close your eyes, and touch your nose with your right hand. Most of us can do it when we're sober. Put a couple drinks into us, do not think that the cop is watching your fingers. The cop is watching your eyes. Because when we're drunk, we peek <laughs> to make sure that the finger's going in the right place. So there's a concentration on fooling uh, others. Uh, I mentioned my sister earlier when she was teaching at uh, State County Votech. Uh, we were just starting to do the training for school sacks. And we had our first training, and I said to my sister, tell your principal you can come to free training, four sessions, teach you how to be a sack. Back in those days, that's all it took. So she asked. Now, she knew more about substance abuse before of me than most. She called me up at night. She said, well, I asked, and I got told no, because at Passaic County Votech, we don't have any drug abuse problems. <laughs> I said, okay, well, this is what we call corporate denial. Okay? So literally, the day we were doing our first training, she was teaching, and a kid comes into her class, football team. My sister's about this tall. This kid was about this tall, about 280 pounds, built like a brick shit house. He comes in, and he's kind of staggering. 
middle of school day. She goes up to him and tries to steady him and says, what do you want? He became very indignant and said, now what makes you think I'm on anything? As he fell on top of her onto the floor. He thought he was functioning normally. Obviously not. But that's what we do. As we learn how to drink, we learn how to compensate for our intoxication. Early on, it's relatively easy to do. As the disease gets worse, not so easy. But in this stage, and again, this is early stage use. This is not addiction. But you're already learning, teaching yourself how to concentrate to fool others. Stage three. Now, stage three is the line. In the first session this morning, I talked about that invisible line between not being addicted and when addiction, if the disease starts with that progression. If we have to pick a line, this is the invisible line between stage two and three. Once you hit stage three, you're starting to talk more about addictive disease. They've crossed the invisible line. We're now going to see the progression in use and behavior. Okay. So this stage frequently begins early high school through young adulthood. The drug use pattern. Use of harder drugs may begin or different drugs may increase. Mixing drugs for a better high. Going back to that additive effect, negating effect, and synergistic effect, this is where they start learning how to mix drugs to get a better high. Now, remember when I talked about progression, going from a lesser degree? Watch the language here. The use of harder drugs increases. Mixing but drugs for a better high. The amount of high do times high during the week increases drinking during school or work. Social use decreases, and the goal is now getting loaded, stoned, blasted, rather than just getting high, whatever the local terms are. Being high starts to become a normal condition. You expect the person to be high. It's not a surprise anymore. Buying more and using more. Most activities start to include chemical highs. Solitary use increases. There's an isolation from other using friends, a lying about or hiding your supply or stash from other friends. In this stage, stage two, we're walking down the street. I say, you want to get high? You say, yeah. You say, do you have anything? You say, no. I say, neither do I. And I go home and get high. This stage, I don't even bother asking somebody else. I just do it alone. And if anybody asks me, I don't have anything, but I know I've got it. So they've crossed that invisible line. <coughs> By the way, being high becoming the normal condition. With kids, this is what you listen to in group. She's really nice, except when she's drinking. He's really a good guy, except when he's high. When you start hearing that kind of a thing, that's the peer group diagnosing that they've crossed over that invisible line. Okay? Parents will sometimes use that same kind of language. They used to be so nice, but now well, every time they drink, this starts happening. So that's the kind of stuff you need to listen to. External behaviors, possible dealing or fronting for others. Concealing financial withdrawals from parents. Empty bottles hidden. This is a curious thing about it, alcoholism. And I've never fully understood it. When I first started working in the field back in 69, I heard about this, couldn't understand it. Alcoholics hide empty bottles. Doesn't make any sense. For me, if I was drinking that much, I'd make sure that I took one bottle a day in my pocket and I'd walk past the neighbor's trash can and I'd put it in the neighbor's trash can. 
because I don't want seven in my trash can. Okay? Um, but there's a concentration on doing that. There's the hiding the bottles. And we, we go to AA meetings, and one of the things that we will frequently hear, two months after I stopped drinking, I was cleaning the house, and I found bottles hidden. I don't remember hiding them because they were in a blackout. But now they're finding all these bottles. I had a case with one of our Catholic high schools years ago. Um, the counselor was saying, we think the kid's got a problem. It was a boy, 16. Big football star and all that sort of thing. And uh, the counselor was saying, you know, we really should do something with the parents and all that. So we had a meeting with the parents at the, at the kid's house, parents' house, without the kid. And we tried to explain, here's the reasons we think there's a problem developing. Well, dad was willing to listen to what the problems were. Mom, in total denial. Not my, my son is so good and all this sort of thing. And one of the things she said was proof of how good he was. He kept his room immaculate. Well, I was a little naive still. And I said, um, can I go check out this room? And I walk in the room and hospital corners on the bed. Everything was in place, not a piece of dust to be found. Everything was perfect. And I'm thinking, I've never seen a 15-year-old boy's room look like this. There's something suspicious. So in my head, I say, can I have permission to kind of check out the drawers and all this sort of thing? So I'm putting my hands in the drawers, figuring I'd find something, nothing. All the little doodads on the top of the dresser that you, the Coke cans that you screw up in the top and hide things in. I checked all them. I go in the closet and I figure there's got to be stuff hidden in the closet, nothing in the closet. At this point, my ego was at risk, okay? Because I'm convinced this kid's got a problem and I can't find anything. And mom is saying, I told you so. And I don't like to be told I told you so. For some reason, I don't know why I stuck my hand between the mattress and the box spring. Bingo. Lift up the mattress. 27 empty vodka bottles hidden between the mattress and the box spring. Now, normal people don't do that. Normal people, if they're trying to sneak their drinking, they get rid of the evidence. Alcoholics hide the bottles. Okay. Never understood why. Still don't. But that was one of the more dramatic experiences that I've had. Okay. School or work attendance. Missing Monday mornings, being late after lunch, leaving early on Fridays, frequent absences. Okay. Now I say this about adolescent drug use. Same thing exists with the staff. If the staff is always missing Monday mornings, being late after lunch, leaving early on Fridays, having frequent absences, the staff may have a problem, okay? But this is a stage of adolescent use, so we'll aim at them. Sleeping during school or work. That's another thing. When I do teacher training, I make sure they know that some of the reasons that kids sleep during school is because the teachers are boring. <laughs> That's one. Another reason can be their home is so dysfunctional and the yelling and screaming and the police knocking on the door all night long that the kid can't sleep and is falling asleep during work. It may not be their drug use, it may be the family system that's broken. So if they're sleeping during school or work, there's a variety of reasons to check it out. It's not just that they're drinking themselves. Possible legal problems. Court for use or possession, juvenile or family court, DWIs, pretrial intervention, probation, drug court, stealing to ensure the, the supply. Attempts to cut down or quit to convince myself or somebody else that there's no problem with limited success. Here's an interesting thing. In early stages of addiction, 
one of the things kid will, kids will do is think to themselves, maybe I got a problem. So I'm going to prove to myself that I don't have a problem. So this weekend, I'm not going to go out. I'm not going to party. I'm just going to stay home and not drink. So Monday morning comes. They went the whole weekend with not drinking. They now say, I'm not an alcoholic. I'm now free to go for the next weekend. Okay? They thought they were in control, so that gave them permission to keep drinking the way they were. And that's where we start seeing progression take place again. Okay. Um, the adult version of that for Catholics is, I'll give it up for Lent. If people are giving up alcohol for Lent, you got to ask why. <laughs> you know, uh, I never fully grasped that. Now I'm a public school graduate, so I didn't give things up for Lent when I was a kid. My mother tried, but it never worked. Okay, a candy bar was the big thing. But why people choose to give up drinking for Lent? When you think about it, that means that it's really something that they're into a lot. And the fact that they're giving it up for Lent, we've got to talk about that a little bit. Okay. Um, Drug-free friends are dropped. Money owed for drugs. Changes in personal habits. And I talked about male-female differences with this. Obvious personality changes when high. Um, and that's that thing where they're really nice except when they're drinking. You know, that's a personality change. So this is the group that has crossed the invisible line. This is the point at which trained drug abuse counselors are probably the better th clinician to be dealing with this rather than just a school counselor. Stage four, this is early high school through young adulthood. This is full-blown dependency and addiction. Drug use pattern getting high during school or work. Now, one of the things that you're going to see every year come out is a study about high school seniors and the amounts of drug use that they play with during the year. The important thing you, not, you need to remember is that those, sur those surveys are underestimating significantly because they're surveying the people that are still seniors. Many kids with alcohol and drug problems quit before senior year, so they're not counted. So the senior year crowd is underestimated in all those studies. Okay? But getting high during school or work, drugs are now used to cope or to escape from self to feel normal. This is in the symptomatic or the duly diagnosed crowd they're now learning to self-medicate and doing it more often. The possible use of injectable drugs can't tell what their normal behavior is anymore because their normal means being high almost constantly. I remember going to a wake one time of a woman. Uh, she had several years of recovery, and she had a um, young adult son who was still actively alcoholic. At the wake, Junior shows up drunk as a skunk. Everybody was saying, oh, how terrible. He showed up drunk at his mother's own wake. What else did they expect? He's been drunk for the last five years. He wouldn't know how to sober up for his mother's wake. You shouldn't be expecting something that's not going to happen. Okay, but when high means being high almost constantly, that's now normal. Don't expect it to be different. School or work is frequently dropped. Stealing may increase, begin or increase. Probable police involvement. Family or friends give, start to give up. And that means there's no stable or safe place for them to live. Our studies have shown us the family gives up before the peer group does. The family may say, you've got to be out of here. The peer group 
we'll put them up. Okay? Now, there's difficulties with that. If you're dealing with somebody under the age of 16, you cannot allow the parents to say, put them out. It's one of the problems with adolescent families. Because if you put the kid out, the kid doesn't get arrested, you get arrested. Because you're responsible for keeping the kid safe as a minor. So you got to be careful with that. That's one of the reasons that when parents of adolescents are trying to find help, they should not be going to regular Al-Anon because the routine Al-Anon response is going to be you draw the line in the sand and you put them out. You do that, you get arrested. There are some other groups that deal specifically with families of adolescents who give different types of, of tips on how to deal with that. And that's the one they should be going to. Tough Love is one of them. Uh, down by me in our parish, we have an Al-Anon group just for parents of adolescents so that they're able to deal with that crazy situation where they're not allowed to push too hard legally. So that's another possibility. Um, where'd I go? Okay. Uh, paranoia increases. I mentioned earlier uh, two types of paranoia, real paranoia and fantasy paranoia. At this stage, this kid should feel paranoid. This, could sh this kid should feel like people are out after them. Family, friends, whatever, are out after them, not to hurt them, but to get them help. Uh, thoughts of and attempts at suicide may increase. And in this stage, when I first did my clinical training, they told us that a suicide attempt is a cry for help. Do not believe that anymore. A suicide attempt is a suicide attempt. And a lot of people, especially a, a lot of young people committing suicide today, know what they're doing. Now, you might be talking with somebody after the event, and one of the things that I've heard young people say a lot who have attempted suicide is say, well, I didn't want to die forever. I just wanted to die for a little while. You can't allow that to have you not respond to the suicide attempt okay? or the, the talking about it. External behavior, physical conditions worsen, weight loss, more frequent illnesses, minor injuries or bruises, possible flashbacks, blackouts, and memory losses becomes more frequent. Weight loss, I mentioned earlier, uh, malnutrition being a major issue, more frequent illnesses, high doses of THC helps break down the immune system. So people that are heavy smokers or users of THC in any way, when they get sick, they will stay sicker longer. If they break a bone, Instead of eight weeks to heal, it may take 12 weeks to heal because the immune system is broken down. So that's one of the things you want to watch for in this late stage stuff. Um, minor injuries or bruises. Most people, if we're walking along and we bump up against a table, no big deal. If I'm a heavy drinker, and I bump up against a table in the same way, black and blue mark. The reason is one of the uh, side effects of heavy drinking is the ends of the, of the uh, capillaries begin to rupture very easily. So a simple brush up against a table, if you're healthy, is fine. No, no marks. Heavy drinker, black and blue mark. Now, if you start seeing black and blue marks where there's no explanation for it, heavy alcohol use may be part of it. The other part of it, it might be, they may be getting physically abused. 
anytime you've got unexplained black and blue marks, do something. Check it out. It may be heavy drinking. It may also be something else. It could be bullying. It could be family abuse. It could be all kinds of situations. Unexplained black and blue marks need to be checked out. Okay. Possible flashbacks. There's more LSD going on right now than there was several years ago. Now you got to remember, LSD is a hallucinogenic drug. You've also got to remember, which most people don't, high dosage mar marijuana use is hallucinogenic. Most people have not been using marijuana to those degrees in the past, but now that we've got THC, that's 99%, you can start having some hallucinations. LSD hallucinations were not exactly, we used to think they were, it was stored in the spinal column, but now that's not exactly as much believed as we once thought. But LSD flashbacks can happen up to seven years after the last use. If you've had experience with LSD and you're now using high dosage marijuana, THC, which can be hallucinogenic, the minor hallucinogenic of the THC can spark off a major flashback from the LSD. So you got to kind of keep a handle on what you're hearing about that stuff. Um, also, most people think marijuana is just like a relaxer. Well, in low doses, yes, it's a relaxer. But in high doses, it's very much hallucinogenic. The other thing marijuana will do as a hallucinogenic, it, it, you ever notice how some people say, well, it relaxes me. Other people say, I get anxiety from it. Other people say, I get depressed. Other people say, oh, it makes me feel good. As a hallucinogenic, what it does, it increases the feeling of the moment. So if you're at a party and you're afraid that the police are going to come in, you're going to be a little paranoid, and you're smoking higher dose marijuana, your feeling of paranoia or free is going to be raised, and you, it's going to make you paranoid. If you're going there without fear, having a good time, you're going to have a really good time at the party, because it's going to increase and multiply the effect of the moment. So marijuana is not at all a simple drug. It's got many different caveats. And people who, uh, who say that they use it and it's not a problem, they may be having one experience of it. But there's a lot of other ways of interpreting it. Uh, use in the morning to cure a hangover. Basically, you're self-medicating uh, withdrawal. Um, the hair of the dog that bit you. That business about if you got a hangover, it takes some of the hair of the dog that bit you. Never understood the analogy. What it means is, if you're in, if you're having a hangover, have a drink. That's why Bloody Marys became so popular. Okay, Bloody Marys for breakfast. Okay, and that that other thing, mimosa, orange juice, and alcohol. Yeah. That was to cure a hangover. It wasn't to be stylish. Okay. <laughs> now, there's a lot of other drugs that we have similar situations with. What's the most common cause for hangover, uh, not hangovers, for headaches in the United States? Don't say 16 year old daughters. <laughs> Actually, yes. It's caffeine withdrawal. We are so much kept on caffeine with stuff that we drink mostly and even eat that most headaches are created by caffeine withdrawal. How do you, how do you cure a headache? Two common ways. If you know it's a caffeine withdrawal, I'll have a cup of coffee. What's the second one? 
take a Tylenol or something like that. Why do you take a Tylenol or some of these other Advils and that sort of thing? Read the printing on the back. See how much caffeine is in it. Oh, you mean like with the bedroom Tylenol? Yeah. Yeah, look on the back. A lot of these things have pretty high doses of caffeine, so that's how it gets rid of the headache. But the cause of the headache is caffeine. It's called a drug addiction. <laughs> okay, So we, we try to medicate ourselves out of withdrawal. Um, change of tolerance, either an increase or a decrease. Most tolerance we describe as needing more and more of the drug to get the effect. There is a thing called reverse tolerance. It doesn't happen with all drugs, but it happens with alcohol. It happens with some opiates. It happens with barbiturates. After a while, you're taking the increased dose to get the effect, but there's a point at which for some people, not everybody, all of a sudden, in the next week, one can of beer puts you where you were when you used to have to drink a case. Okay? So tolerance is normally an increased dose. Reverse tolerance is after you've had the increase, all of a sudden your body switches and it now takes a little amount of the dose to get the same effect. So an increase in dosage or a decrease in dosage is involved with tolerance. Symptoms of physical addiction or withdrawal, when that happens. The shame and guilt feelings increase in surface. Notice I said shame and guilt. That's usually together. Questioning your own use, but now there's a loss of control. In stage three, I say, I think I might have a problem. So I'm not going to drink this weekend. So I make it through the weekend, I don't have a problem. Thank God I don't have a problem. Now I can go back to my normal drinking. In this stage, I think I might have a problem. I'm not going to drink this weekend. Prove it to myself again. And the next morning, I wake up from a hangover because I couldn't make it through Friday night. I try to control the drinking, but I can't control it. I've lost control. Low self-esteem and a lot of uh, low self-image and a lot of self-hate. Casual sexual involvements, not to mean that anyone who has casual sex is an addict. Okay. What this means is there's no relationship. It's sex for the sex of sake of sex. Denial full syndrome is in full swing. Even though the world is falling down around me, I don't believe I have a problem. Here's a classic one. My friends are all burnouts, and I'm glad to be one of them. That's pure pressure to the nth degree. When you hear, when you hear somebody saying things like that, you now have a full-blown addictive personality. Okay. Okay. Uh, so these four stages, what I'd like to do with this, sometimes show it to a group, show it to the individual, let them self-identify what stage they're at. You get a new client, you let them pick out what stage they're at, that gives you a starting point for where you're doing the counseling. You have the client self-identify their stage and then two weeks later, you let the parents go through the same thing and see how they identify where the kid is, and you may get a different picture because the kid may still be in den denial about some things or just hiding. So there's a lot of ways to use this, and that's why I gave you the handout. Um, Angela's got extra copies, so uh, you can make some extras. I think this is a good, another good tool to use with clients. Questions or discussions on this? I am five minutes ahead of myself here. <laughs> now, as a little OCD, that's good for me, but the tape has another five minutes on it. So, have any questions? Good, good, good point. And the latest that I've heard, it's now considered 26.
Yeah. yeah. I've used these same cards sometimes when talking to adults yeah, right. and saying, just, astu- just assume that you're still an adolescent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because most people who are trying to deal with their problems will admit that they're not the most adult thinkers. Mm-hmm. So it's rather easy to use this with just about anybody. And if you take the line out there about early high school and all that, you can use it with anybody. Yeah.